general relativity step by step. Over the last few screencasts, I think there's been 60 in altogether, or 60 altogether, we've talked about this rather sophisticated uh, mathematical theory of curvature, of tensors, we've got covariant uh, differentiation, we've got con covariant and contravariant indices, parallel transport, I'm just flicking back through some of the some of the previous content, and we can see that there is quite a large amount of mathematical sophistication. This is a very sophisticated theory. Um, all this theory, this is just mathematics. And as such, it works for any uh, manifold. Not necessarily a physically realistic one. It might work over the solution space for some awkward differential equation. You might be solving some differential equation and you might index your solutions in terms of 27 variables and those 27 variables form this sort of peculiar non-physical 27 dimensional space. So you might be working in r to the power 27, well let's just say r to the power 26 let's say, and then you can call them a, b, c up to z. Um, 26 real numbers that, that, that correspond to some point in some abstract space. And the mathematics that we've been talking about in terms of curvature tensors and so forth uh, works perfectly well for this kind of, kind of uh, non-physical system. It might be 26 dimensional, it might have some awkward, terrible global topology, it might have bits missing, it might have regions of interest and regions of boringness and so forth. So the mathematical theory we've developed works for a general manifold. What I'm going to do now, from now on, I'm going to focus on a four-dimensional, or four dimensions, and I'm going to call that a four dimensions, oops, back to the maths, I'm not quite sure why it does that. I'm going to focus on four dimensions. We've got R cubed for space, and I've got R for time. So we've got this peculiar, uh, peculiar three and one um, structure, which together make a space time. So lots of this mathematics becomes a lot easier because I'm considering a particular dimensional space, um, and lots of things become a lot more easy. I'm actually going to consider physics. I'm actually going to consider physical reality. I'm going to consider space-times that make sense and match experimental observations. And that is a non-trivial a, 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 a non um, process. And in particular, in physics, there's this thing called C, which equals the speed of light. Um, and I'm going to make the I'm not going to make the observation. I'm going to I'm going to observe that that all observers agree on C, which is the of course your Michelson Morley experiment. Michelson Morley experiment, and they were expecting to see um, different speeds of light in different directions corresponding to the Earth's motion through the luminiferous ether, which was the current uh, theory for light propagation at the time. And they came out with a null result. Michelson and Morley made the uh, then astonishing observation, well, very controversial. The, the, the arguments went on and on and on for decades. Um, they made the observation that the speed of light was constant. They said that C was constant, and it didn't depend on your direction, it didn't depend upon your motion through space, which they thought was uh, going to affect the uh, measurement of the speed of light. And they had a very sensitive uh, system, it's since been improved by a few orders of magnitude, um, making the somewhat counterintuitive observation that the speed of light is constant for everyone. So I'm going to assume that. But I want to be clear what I'm doing. I am making a non-mathematical, well, it's sort of mathematical. It's a non-mathematical, it's a physical observation. This is, this is, a, this is an experiment, this is an observation. 
which may or may not be true, but it seems to be true, and I'm going to assume it. I'm going to assume that the speed of light is constant for all observers. So I'm going to make, from now on, I'm going to make two observations. I'm going to make two... Um, actually, I'm going to make another one. I'm also going to talk about uh, the, uh, the uh, equivalence principle. Okay, so what's that? The equivalence principle basically says, here's me, and I'm sitting there, and uh, here's a black hole, and I'm in all sorts of other trouble. The, the, there's a black hole here, there's, a, there's another black hole, which is moving towards me at 0.99 times the speed of light. I've got all sorts of things. There's a monster going to eat me, a te terrible, terrible situation. Let me draw that monster again. There's the monster. Evil-looking fish there. And so there's a black hole here, and I'm going to fall in that black hole. There's another black hole coming towards me. My rocket engines have, have, have burst, uh, and I'm in terrible, terrible, terrible trouble. Now, the equivalence principle basically says that if I build myself a little elevator, here it is, uh, there's my little elevator, and I can construct this around myself, and that basically says that my laws of physics look the same as they always do. My laws of physics are independent of what's happening outside my little box. I might need, to, might need to build that box very small, but inside that inside that elevator, my laws of physics look the same as anybody else's. If I open the window and have a look out, I might say, oh my goodness me, I'm going to die. But while I'm inside my little elevator, my laws of physics are the same as anybody else's, and they never change, because it's in free fall free fall. And I might be orbiting around a black hole. All sorts of terrible things might happen. But the equivalence principle is basically, in loose language, that the laws of physics look the same on a sufficiently small length scale, no matter what is happening outside your little box. So I'm going to make these these rather innocuous looking assumptions. This is in fact, a, what I'm the way I think about relativity is that it's a mathematical theory of tensors and curvature and so forth. And what we're going to do is to look at the general theory, and then we're going to look at an interesting special case, which is four dimensions, where you've got this physical observation that all observers agree on the speed of light. And you've also got this equivalence principle, which is, in addition, which basically says that whatever is happening elsewhere in the universe, inside my little box, my laws of physics always look the same. And in particular, I will still observe the speed of light being constant. So I might set up a little experiment with light bouncing around or something like that. There is no way, according to the equivalence principle, that what is occurring outside my box, so long as I'm in free fall, will affect the laws of physics as I observe them locally inside my box. And that's the equivalence principle. And these, these are not mathematical statements. These are statements of observational physics. They are statements that people observe, they make sense, they uh, are very realistic, they are very intuitive, they're very natural, but they are not mathematics. They are not driven by the mathematics of the situation. They are driven by our observations of the universe. They are driven by clocks and meter sticks and Michelson-Morley experiments and so forth. They are not true in large numbers of interesting mathematical uh, cases such as la high dimensional solutions of complicated partial differential equations but they do seem to be true in our physical universe and i'm going to spend the next oh i don't know how many lots of screencasts talking about what mathematics looks like with these assumptions here stop <laughs>